I'm Dave Murphy, and I guess I'm de facto chairing now since since our last get together. I wound up chair of the finance committee, and that's the nucleus of this committee. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Everyone has a copy of the appraisal. Corinne has some more copies, and I guess we get some on the ground too. So, um, I do not believe we have minutes from our last meeting. Do we? Do we have minutes? No, it was a taped meeting. So, video. okay. So there's no. And if, if no one has any objections, rather than official public comment, is everyone comfortable with taking questions as we go along so that we get our public input that way, rather than, you know, unless somebody from the public wants to make a statement and go, you're, you're welcome to ask questions during the process, and uh, that way we, if something comes up we want to speak about, we, we can just join in the conversation. So our topic for today is review and discussion of the appraisal that was done by Kim Levich on the building. Any, uh, one more? You, you want to do a brief thumbnail presentation of the, essentially saying what her appraisal amount was? Um, he, this, this is your, he, he, oh, okay. He, yeah. What his appraisal was? This is your bailiwick. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Yes. Kim, <laughs> Kim, 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 Kim Levich, uh, Levich Associates. Okay. Uh, to just go over the process, the city put out an RFP for appraisals. Uh, Kim was the only one that responded willing to do it. We, the, two, the two contenders we hoped for were Crowley Associates from Springfield, uh, Kim Levich. Those were the two that responded. They could not deal with the original time frame, so they were contacted and told, you can have another month if you would like to do it. Um, Levich Associates was the only one that actually was willing to do the work in the price range that was advertised. Uh, Crowley Associates, in fact, I even called Mr. Crowley to say, you know, what would it take for you to do this appraisal? And I think he was looking for about twice the fee we were willing to pay and was not sure when he could get around to it. So really, Mr. Levich was the only one that responded in a positive way. He took the extra month to do the report as well, though, but he was willing to do it reasonably for the for, in the price range that we were looking for is still substantial, so that's why Mr. Levitt was the one to appraise it. Has every, you know, I'm, I'm going to just highlight things in the report. If every, has everybody read it? Are you at all familiar? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the, the first thing I'm going to read from this, there's a lot of boilerplate in these. It is required by the state appraisal license law, so yes, there's a lot of boilerplate. The state requires it to be in there. Um, <clears throat> page 14, where he discusses the building. A lot of everything before that is, is sort of a description of the structure. But I think the important thing that he notes is at the bottom of page 14 where he talks about the issues with the building that would affect his value. And I'll just read that for the members out there that may not have one. The subject suffers from a number of types of depreciation. Most of these are typical of older school buildings of this vintage. They include a general physical deterioration of the property. The bigger issues are in terms of functional obsolescence. These items include most of the major systems. The HVAC is antiquated and for all practical reasons at the end of its economic life. The wiring and plumbing are not up to current codes. Lighting is both inefficient and not up to current expectations. Many of the windows in the building are older single pane units that are ineffective. There is a lack of insulation in the building, a lack of modern energy uh, of modern energy efficiency in the building results in low yields for use as office or artist pay. Find, uh, finally, access to the building is not up to current handicapped expectations. So he goes to describe the building at length, but those are the issues that he came up with in the end that helped him with his condition, his condition status for the building that he uses later on in the report. Uh, the Approaches to value, he does a highest and best use analysis, which essentially the conclusion of the highest and best use analysis, which is his, him determining what the building could be that would result in its greatest value, what use would result in its greatest value. And there we do okay. The current use, office and artist space, rental with the potential for mixed use conversion in the future, 
and mixed use would include second floor with more spaces. So he, he agrees that the current uses of the building are probably its highest and best use um, for the highest and best use analysis, and that, that's important. So at least it's, it's being used in a manner that he says will conform with zoning and result in its highest value. <coughs> Um, one of the two approaches to value he uses is the income approach. In fact, it's the one he appears to have based the most emphasis on as an opinion of value. That's on page 23. So if you go to the graph on page 23, the top half of that graph is simply a rent roll for the building. Right? So there's a rent roll for the building at the top. It breaks it down by square foot by month, annualizes it, and, uh, and, and so on. When you go to the bottom part of the chart, the first item he talks about is potential, uh, gross potential income. Now that is his opinion of what the building would generate for income at full occupancy, 100% occupancy. And that's $135,583. Now the next line, which is market rent adjustment, he has made the assumption in looking at the rents that they are probably 15% below what he feels market rent would be. So he steps up that $135,000 number by $20,337. So he's acknowledging in his income statement that the rents are potentially 15% below where they should be. So he, he increases them. <coughs> then he puts in a 10% adjustment um, for vacancy. The fact that in a building this size, there's theoretically possible that you won't always have every unit occupied all the time. And this number typically is 5 to 10 percent based on the number of units in the building history. So he takes off $13,558 for the fact that of the potential rental amount stepped up to current market, you're not going to get it all every year. So that takes that into, into consideration. So his effective income, gross effective income, is 143,362. Okay. From that number, then he deducts known expenses for the building, because what he's looking to get to <coughs> is what, something called net operating income, which is your adjusted income minus your known expenses. So for the expenses, um, he put in $7,000 for real estate taxes, although the building is not currently taxed. It would be in a commercial environment. Um, $5,000 for property insurance. Um, it, it, it really does take $42,000 worth of oil to heat that place in a year, so he takes off the utilities. Uh, the electric of $14,000, water and sewer of $2,000, a 12% management fee if it was being professionally managed for $17,000. He takes off 15% for maintenance, repair, snow, trash removal. That's $21,000. Reserve for replacement for things that may need to repair. That's $7,118. And he puts in 5% for things you never think of that might need to be done there. So the total expenses come to $122,674. When you subtract that from the $142,362, you come up with a net operating income before debt service of $19,688. So does it make sense how he got, you know, if we step through it, he got to the point where, where he indicated that. The uh, <coughs> things that are important to me is that he did take in consideration that the rents might not actually be at market at this point, so he stepped it up. And that I think he reasonably accounted for four um, I items um, that would be routine maintenance. The yes, one sir. thing that is not in here that I would bring to your attention is that we are all very concerned about the heating system. Now, theoretically, the reserve for replacement, the $7,000 that's in there for uh, reserve for replacement, um, if that had been being collected ever since this building was rented, there'd be a nice little nest egg there that could be used for replacement of the heating system. If at this point the heating system were to go, in this synopsis, there is no reserve to replace it. And I, you know, I think that's going to be a little bit of a problem. So for somebody buying the building, if the building was in reasonable shape, if they put away $7,000 every year you know, for future things, it would have a time, time to build up. But at this point, we're looking at a heating system that it, you know, could go next season. So, question? I just, <clears throat> I just wanted to also just confirm with you that the, um, 
didn't just pick that 15% undervaluation, the rent number out of the hat. Earlier in the report, he goes through an analysis of rents mm -hmm. in other parts of the yeah. city. So that's how he arrived at that particular number, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He did, would have done a rental survey earlier okay. earlier on okay. to justify that number. Okay. Um, so if you take the, what what is his net income before services or net operating income of $19,000, and you flip to the next page, <coughs> which is where he does his actual income capitalization, and, and that is a process by which you take a cash flow amount and you use a factor to indicate value. And the top half of this, and, and it, it's, a little, it's a little much to get into, but this is where he bills his capitalization rate or what he, what he thinks that rate should be. And he essentially comes up with three different rates. If you look at the bottom section, he comes up with a conservative rate, he comes up with an optimistic rate and a most likely rate. And they vary by, you know, about a percent. 7.87 uh, is the conservative one, 6.87 is the optimistic one, and then he's got one that's somewhere in the middle. And what you do is you divide, and this kind of defies logic, but the lower the rate, the higher indicated value, because what you do is divide, you divide the income by the rate, and that indicates the, the, the indicated value from that approach. And I know it's a little mind-boggling that you, you know, you divide a large number by a small percentage and come up with a giant number, but it's the wonder of mathematics. You know, you're, you're dividing by something less than one. So the three, the, the conservative one is 250, the uh, high one is 286, and the one in the middle is 266, he averages it to 270. Um, so that's how he comes up with the results of his income capitalization, All right? Does any, anybody have any specific questions about that? I know it's a lot of number crunching and that's the nature of commercial appraisals, but anybody have any particular questions about it? How would you, how would you, um, how would you describe that? Income capitalization, sort of in layman's terms, to, to somebody like what what that number would represent to someone. Just really putting it in very basic terms. What what they do in that approach is look to develop a relationship between how much income something will generate on a monthly or annual basis, and a, a relationship to what its sale price would be. And in a perfect world where, uh, you know, on the residential side or somewhere where a lot of similar properties are rented and sell all the time, you can do direct capitalization, which is you take, uh, if let's say we have a very active market for four unit buildings and all the apartments rent for $1,000 and the buildings sell for 400000 and there's six of these things a year that each rent for you know, each unit rents for $1,000 for $4,000 rental amount, and they all sell for $400,000. If you divide those two numbers together, you come up with a capitalization rate or a relationship between the rent roll and the ultimate value of the building. Now, when you deal with anomaly, anomaly buildings like this one, uh, schools, churches, post offices, buildings that are, are made for a specific function that don't sell every day, that they're around in the marketplace, but they don't sell all the time, uh, you're forced to, to extract a capitalization rate by other means because we don't have four or five schools that sold in Northampton recently. And the same is true with post offices and churches, although at any minute there could be a whole bunch of churches selling, but that hasn't happened yet. So you have to, you have to construct your cap rate in a different manner, which is what he does at the top of this chart. Uh, and it's, some of it is the examination of other ways that you could invest your money or you could look at, as he does, a holding period and what it's going to cost you to borrow your money and um, the loan term and, and what your down payment's going to be because you need a return on that investment. So you want a return of your investment and a return from, from your investment and a return on your investment. Um, so in this instance, because he can't do direct capitalization to extract it. He has to do it this way and construct a rate. So he, he does the traditional method of coming up with net operating income by generating an, uh, an income statement and then deducting his expenses. But the cap rate here 
um, he needs to come up with by deriving it from the market and alternative investments and also the expectation <coughs> of, of an investor. So that's how he comes up with the rate. But the, the rate or ratio is the relationship between the rent roll and the ultimate value of the building. You know, much like the tax rate is a, a ratio between the value of your building and what you're paying for taxes. So, any other questions? I know, yes. So we're just in a unique position where we actually have renters in there, so we have a rent roll to go mm -hmm. from. What would they have worked from if not to come up with that category? Um, other, earlier in the report, he generates market rent which is how he came up with the fact that he thought these rents were 15% low. Mm -hmm. So if the building was totally vacant, he could have taken his uh, rental study and come up with a value per square foot and mm -hmm. then applied it to these uh, to come up with what he thought the building would rent for. It is, <coughs> it's more reassuring that there are existing rents and that all he's determining is a, uh, you know, a, a a percentage of those rents are off what he feels market is. So at, we know that, for instance, starting off before he makes that adjustment, he's within 15% of what would be reasonable. If he completely derived his rents from his rental survey, there could be more of a question as where is he? You know, he says we're about 15% off, which is sort of, you can kind of get your head around the fact that eh, that's probably the case because mm -hmm. some of these rents are older. Yes? Which market did he base? Uh the rent is it strictly Northampton? The local market is what he would have used. But you know. they use Florence as well. Like there's a big difference between Florence and Northampton. I'm wondering if this study was strictly based on Northampton rate, or did he also? And it would, well, it would have also been based on this sort of structure. You know, so it wouldn't be. It's not like doing a rental survey. It's more mm -hmm. a commercial survey. Those things still are different. But um, it would have been it would have been based on what he felt the market area was for this building and this type of property because this isn't you know a class A office rental or something this is more like the things that uh, you find in arts and industry or you find in the non tuck building or something like that. So we compare that with that. That's well. yeah. He wouldn't have done you know class A office space. He would have done similar things. Okay. Marianne, you had a question? Yes, um, I had called Joan Seraphim today because I was very concerned. Looking at the city's assessment at three million one hundred and seventeen thousand five hundred and fifty, which was twelve times more than what Kim's um, assessment was at two hundred and seventy thousand. Miranda, this her I, I, I understand that, but let me finish. Okay, I have great concerns of that. I did read this, counselor. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's my job to question about this being done, all right? So, I talked with Joan, and she said that the assessment was changed. For fit for 13. At, what was it? At by 13, it's a million 444. Okay, million. so which is still five times more than what he's assessing it at. Mm -hmm. So, why? Because what she did, um, is the cost approach on this building. There were three approaches to value. We went over the income approach. Uh, Kim also did the market approach where he looked at the sales of similar buildings, you know, similar school buildings in Western Massachusetts, Hampshire, Franklin County that it sold. So you compare those sales and try and draw a correlation. The third approach is what's called the cost approach. And with the cost approach, what you do is essentially reconstruct the building that's there and then you depreciate it down to its current condition. So you build a new building you know, with all the functional issues this building has, and then you depreciate it down to its current physical condition, and then you add in its land value. Now that is a typical process that assessors use in mass appraisal for these anomaly buildings that don't sell very often, like churches and post offices and schools and things that they don't sell every day. Um, one of the reasons they tend to do that is that it's very easy for the computer to crunch the math. They do it, they do it very quickly and very easily with known, with known factors. Um, the reason they don't is that it's a much more involved thing to do the income approach because you have to analyze the rent rolls and then you, you have to do all the steps. Kim, to analyze the rent rolls, the 
determine if it's market rent, do an expense analysis, and so on and so on. They tend to not do that for these buildings that are exempt from taxation anyway. You know, these values, this is an exercise in popping out a value that goes in a file cabinet because these buildings aren't taxed. And typically churches aren't taxed, post offices aren't taxed, so the computer spits out a number and the assessors really don't worry what that number is because nothing ever happens with it, so they stick it in a drawer and that's the end of it. So quite often you will find the values on some of these buildings are, are much higher than you think they would be. Um, and no one really worries about it or does anything to it. Um, Marianne, as Marianne indicated, the value that they were carrying for this building in fiscal 12 was three million something. And this year they took a look at it because of this process and said, oh my goodness, this number is, you know, this is quite off the wall. So they, uh, they changed the factor, came up with a million four forty four, but it really is pretty much the same kind of number. It, because it's never going to be taxed, they don't spend a lot of time on it. Talking, talking with Jones, you also mentioned about the lot itself would be worth like two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Actually, the land value they're carrying in this report is seven hundred and seventy-five six ninety. You know, that's what they. I'm just saying yeah. what Joan had told me about a lot that could be made out of that. Mm -hmm. That could go for that mm -hmm. high price. The uh, the assessed value of the land. That they're carrying in here is mm -hmm. 775, but you know, and that's the that's the strangeness of it all. The land value the year before, the land was valued at 633. This year it's 775. The building was at 2 million 484 last year. This year it's 668, 668,000. So really, and quite truthfully, the amount of effort that goes into doing these exempt buildings is whatever the computer <coughs> has to spit out because the number is not going anywhere. It's just a number that gets fit out because the thing has a lot, map, lot, map and lot number. Um, they quality grade for the building, they call it C+. Um, that seems to you know, be a little higher condition than I would imagine the building is in now. So it, it really is, again, not, not something that they spend a heck of a lot of time on. What was, Councilman, what was the total price of the repairs and maintenance? Do you remember, Councilman? Oh, a million two, isn't it? Dave, Dave's here. Dave, uh, comrades. What what was your estimate for, you know, for heating and electrical and handicapped accessibility and, and abatement of asbestos and stuff for the building? Yeah. A million two. Was yeah. it was point one, one point three, somewhere in that in range. That, in that kind of range. Under one point five. Under one point five, but between a million two and a million five. So yes. Which, you know, it's kind of it's it's kind of interesting, but if you were to take the, uh, the appraised value of the building at 270 or whatever Kim came up with, and add in those improvements, Joan's number looks pretty accurate. It looks pretty yeah, accurate. Right. <laughs> it's true. It is. Yeah. For a building that then would be in maybe C plus. Okay. I likened it a lot to like the Cole Morgan site on King Street. A piece of land is worth a tremendous amount of money, many millions of dollars. But with the building on it, it was worth only $1.7 million to a developer because of the cost of the building. The building is actually a millstone. The land, if the building were not there, the land would be worth more. And it, it, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that you have to weigh. And, and the appraisal at $270,000, I never thought that this was a diamond in the rough, like, we were, like it was a $3 million structure. Or, sale point for us, uh, but I anticipated a low appraisal on it, but it's worth as much as it's worth to whoever wants to buy it. It's not, uh, I suppose if you put it up for auction, uh, who knows where it would go. Uh, somebody might like that 38 Duesenberg or <laughs> but, it, it, but it's a tough thing to figure. It's what I, I, I sympathize with uh, anybody that's trying to appraise such a site. Um, there are huge issues that um, we talked about. Uh, asbestos is one of the biggest ones. Every one of those floor tiles in that building is an asbestos floor tile. Um, it just uh, it, it just it mounts. 
just continues to mount. If the building were not there, I would say that the piece of land was probably worth close to maybe seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. But you have to work around that building. No matter where you enter that building, you're not entering out on the floor. You're entering it somewhere in the middle of the floor. Um, the drainage in the back is a huge problem. Every time it rains, it floods. The building floods. The basement floods. Well, that's not true. There are just many, many issues. I think David Pomerantz can speak to it, too. It floods? It floods. In the basement. It, it, it takes torrential, torrential rain, and then there's a little bit... It's flooded about two times since yeah. I've been there, and it flooded bad those two times. Yeah. And at least one of those had to do with a uh, blockage that was in the sewer outflow, you know, that the storm drain. And they worked on that, fixed it up to some degree. We had one other incident where a lot of other properties were terribly flooded and are flooded, but I don't know what you're talking about as far as it flooding every time it rains. But that's well, definitely not the case. Well, my studio flooded when I first moved in there. Not flooded, but rain used to come in through the roof. The roof's now in great shape, so yep. not an issue there. But for a developer to put any money into that building, he's got to, he has to he has to attack the drainage. The drainage is awful. The back it flows into the back of the building, and whether not on a regular once, basis. What's that? Not on a regular basis. No, I mean, the ground slopes to the back of the building. Yes. Yeah, absolutely it does. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been there on several occasions. You, 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 you don't get flooding on the inside of the building on any kind of regular basis. It's not that it couldn't happen again. Okay. But your concern just is if somebody was to undertake a complete re rehab of the building, they would correct that situation so that after they rehab the building, it would never happen again. Right. You know, you, you change, you know, if you're doing the whole building over, you'd also change, change the drainage and put some space between the asphalt and the foundation so the water had a place to go rather than actually reach the building. I mean, it would just make sense to do that. Which is just one of the drawbacks yeah. of trying to sell the building to a developer. Yeah. Right. Now, on page 27 of your report is the other approach, the value that he chose to, to use. <coughs> and that's the sales comparison approach, where he took the sale of several other school-type buildings and essentially ran them down to uh, a value per square foot, which he said was 765 a square foot, and the building is 30,565 square feet. So he came up with two, 235 from, from that approach to value. And then probably the, the one page you could read that would tie his whole analysis together is page 28, where he does his reconciliation where he does his reconciliation and then talks about the approaches to value. And uh, I'll just read that for whoever may be watching the video and doesn't have it. But the sales comparison approach is based on my highest and best use conclusion, which is for the subject, which is that building, as an office artist rental space. I've also considered the potential for conversion into some type of housing on the second floor, with it most likely, likely use being artist live workspace. My sales comparison <coughs> approach is based on two sales of elementary schools. Both are multi-story and are approximately the same age and design as the subject. I've added an older three-story brick mill building sale that was later converted into mixed use with office on the first floor and apartments on the second floor. The final sale is actually a pending elementary school sale. This is an older brick multi-story building of similar vintage as the subject. It faces more difficult zoning restrictions than the subject for reuse. And it, is, and it is in a location with an overall lower rental structure, thus value with, with a lower value than the subject. Overall, the sales bra bracket the subject, uh, bracket the subject, there are two sales smaller, one larger, and one of about the same size. The sales also bracket the subject for condition and quality of construction. However, none of the sales are in Northampton. One is a pending sale, and one was in fair condition at the time of sale. These weaknesses offset some of the similarities of my sales. My conclusion using the sales approach is 235, uh, and, and this is considered to have moderate support. Then he talks about the capitalization approach, which we went through first, that he had developed the income capitalization report, the client provided a rent roll, historical records for expenses back to 2006. From these, along with some market adjustments uh, for rent and accounting for some typical additional expenses, I've calculated the value. Since my conclusion of highest and best use 
for invest use is for continued rental of the property by an investor, this is the most appropriate method of valuation. It is also uh, my best supported approach. My conclusion from this approach is 270, and then he simply goes on to say that it's 270 is the number that he had uh, the greatest confidence in. And I don't believe that uh, he developed a cost approach at all, which is the, the which is the approach that the, uh, the assessor's computer likes to use for these kind of buildings. And that is simply because the cost approach, for all intents and purposes, is least useful on an old building, because you take an old building with all these functional anomalies, and then you go to the current expense of rebuilding that building, which is astronomical, because you wouldn't build it the same way it's built now. And then because of its relatively poor condition, you build a building up, that costs more than one would have ever imagined to build it, and then you have to depreciate that number back down to its current condition from brand new. And that is just so much number crunching. The more numbers you crunch, the less accurate you get, which is probably the biggest reason for the difference is that the appraiser we hired chose not to use that approach at all. And that's the one that's the easiest for the assessor's computer to use because it doesn't require the analysis of income or of sales. You simply put in a size put in what you think the condition is, and the computer does the rest and spits out a number, that may not be all that relevant. But again, for the assessor, since this is a taxable building, it goes in the file and, and no one ever really asks to see it until someone asks to see it, and then it isn't really that relevant a number. Oh, Councilman Dwight, good. I, I, uh, this is to the mayor. In, in the best of all possible worlds, what is the, the outcome that the city would prefer to reach? I, I would assume, and I'm, correct me when I'm wrong, um, one would be reestablish property back on the tax roll. Uh, that's probably one of the bigger driving things, and also to unencumber the city from any additional investment in, in, the, in the structure would probably be another of the two major driving features of this. Um, if and someone wanted to pass 1.7 million, we take it. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, and, and include, I mean, even based on the appraised value, does that really play into the process of the decision? Because, I mean, are we technically going to market this at 270? No, no, no. I, I mean, we did this as an act. I mean, I think more, I think at the time when we talked about it, I think less about the final number and more about, I think, some of the stuff that Councillor Murphy's been discussing. The stuff that got revealed. In just the about the, anomal the, the anomalous nature of the building. I mean, I was struck actually by the fact that how low the other buildings all sold for. You know, 50000 for the right. school in Greenfield, or 80000 you know, 50000 130. Obviously, they're in different communities, but I think it does speak to, there weren't any that are selling for over a million dollars. Um, uh, so, so I guess what, what we, and the other part of this is legally, if we sell this building, um, the city ha is required by law to get a market rate appraisal. So we would have to get this market rate appraisal. Um, so it serves that purpose. Whether it, it, that doesn't require that it's sold for that, it doesn't require that it has to be offered for that. It's just something that a step that has to be taken. Um, 